the public policy may be race neutral. The results could be very much racialized. And so if you make an effort to have a war on drugs, but you only target certain communities, that's going to destabilize that community differentially. So I think you know, what has happened in terms of the Moynihan report that is that is that been a bit misleading is that there's the individual decisions that we're making about whether or not we're going to be married, whether or not we're going to stay married, uh, what that means. Um, there's the mythology about the availability of men versus women and there's you know, misleading data around that. But there's also the structural piece that has allowed a society to say, you know what, we don't care if we destabilize this family. We don't care if our policies have a differential and disparate outcome on certain groups and people as opposed to others. We're going to move forward even though the policy is not a fair one. And I think that's resulted in the kind of situation that Moynihan was looking at. He struggled with understanding the structural pieces of it, and that's so critical to it. It's not just individual decisions that get made. The, the political idea of equality is used to say, well, everybody has an equal chance. Uh, one of the things Moynihan was very clear on is there's a 300-year history of not having an equal chance, uh, and that creating a civil rights movement is important uh, it can create an equality of opportunity, but it can't create what he called an equality of results. And he tried to get at why. Um, but as long as government stopped caring about the results as they affected poor people and started caring about the results as they affected wealthy people, um, then things changed and, and a lot of people have been left behind and this, it, it's a double tragedy in that they're left behind and we don't know that they're left behind. Nobody, nobody is made aware of it and I think that's a lot of that's what, what happened in the 90s and, you know, and, and, and it's a shame. It's, it's really a shame. Okay, folks, we're going to get started with um, part four. Um, this particular chapter or is the second largest chapter in the book um, so I may have to break this particular chapter up into two parts I was trying to get all the uh, chapters in one part um, so that we'll have a natural break but I don't think I'll be able to do it within the allotted 30 minutes I don't want to um, do a, an hour segment on this I know it can get kind of tiring and I would rather people finish the whole segment a smaller segment until they get everything rather than um, them basically leaving off in the middle but we're going to get started okay this is chapter three the roots of the problem which is uh uh since it is the second biggest chapter but it's also the second most important chapter uh the tangle of pathology i think is uh a little bit more pertinent to what we're doing now but this is also a very important piece the roots of the problem slavery the most perplex perplexing question about American slavery, which has never been altogether explained and which in indeed most Americans hardly know exists, has been stated by Nathan Glazer as follows. Why was American slavery? The most awful the world has ever known. The only thing that it can that can that can be said with certainty is that this is true. It was American slavery was profoundly different from and in its lasting effects on individuals and their children, indescribably worse than any recorded servitude, ancient or modern. This is a really really profound. Um, statement and it's not well understood but he touches on it here now, this is game you know this this is game the particular peculiar nature of, of American slavery was noted by Alex Alexis de Tocqueville and others but it was not until 1948 that Frank Tannenbaum a South American specialist pointed to the striking differences between Brazilian and American slavery. The feudal Catholic society of Brazil had a legal and religious tradition which accorded the slave a place in human 
in, in a, as a human being in the hierarchy of society. Luckless and miserable place to be, to be sure, but a place withal. In contrast, there was nothing in the English in the tradition of English law or Protestant theology which could accommodate to the fact of human bondage. The slaves were therefore re the slaves were therefore reduced to the the status of chattels, which is animals. Often, no doubt, well cared for, even privileged chattels, but chattels nonetheless. In other words, um, Northern Europeans had no experience about slavery because uh, their experience was serfdom and landlords. Whereas the Mediterranean was an older society and slavery, even from the Greeks on on up, they had a tradition of integrating uh, slaves as human beings because slaves were captured in war. So, so the slavery experience was new to Northern Europeans. They didn't know how to handle it. So they, since, since the, the, there was no law or precedent for having slaves, they re, they, they uh, reduced the human status of the people they enslaved. Glazer also f focusing on the Brazil United States comparison. In Brazil, the slave had many more rights than in the United States. He could legally marry, which the black people couldn't do. He could, he, he could indeed had to be baptized and become a member of the Catholic Church. His family could not be broken up. Get this. This is game. This is game, boss. Check this out. His family could not be broken up for sale, and he had many days on which he could either rest or earn money to buy his freedom. The government, the government encouraged manumission. In other words, paying for your freedom. And the freedom of infants could often be purchased for a small sum at the baptismal. In short, the Brazilian slave knew he was a man and he differed in degree, not in kind from his master. Very, very profound. This is game. In the United States, the slave was totally removed from the protection of organized society. Which continues today. Compare the elaborate provisions for the protection of slaves in the Bible. His existence as a human being was given no recognition by any religious or secular agency. He was totally ignorant of and completely cut off from his past. In other words, his culture was destroyed and he was offered absolutely no hope for the future. His children could be sold. His marriage was not recognized. His wife could be violated or sold. Get this. This is this is key. This is this. This is key. This is the this is the root of the problem between black men and women. There was there there was something comic about calling the woman with whom the master permitted him to live with a wife. He could also be subject without redress to frightful barbar barbarities. There were presumably as many saddest among slave owners, men and women, as there are in other groups. The slave could not by law be taught to read or write. He could not practice any religion without the permission of his master and he could never meet with his fellows for religious or any other purposes except in the presence of a white and finally if a master wished to free him every legal obstacle 
was used Every legal officer was used to thwart, sort, thwart such action. Get that. It was structural. It had nothing to do with the individuals. This is structural. This was not what slavery meant in the ancient world. In the medieval and early modern Europe or in Brazil, and the West Indies. More important, slavery was also awful in its effects. If we compare the present situation of the American Negro with that of, say, let's say, Brazilian Negroes who were slaves 20 years longer, we will begin to suspect that the difference are the result of very different patterns of slavery. To, today, br the Brazilian Negroes are Brazilians, Though most are poor and do hard and dirty work of the country, as Negroes do in the United States, they are not cut off from society. They reach into the highest strata, merging there in smaller and smaller numbers, it is true, but with complete acceptance with other Brazilians of all kinds. The relations between Negroes and whites in Brazil show nothing of the mass irrationality that prevails in this country. This is a this is a lesson in a small paper. Stanley M. Elkins drawing the drawn on the aberrant behavior of, of the prisoners in Nazi concentration camps drew an elaborate parallels between the two institutions. This thesis has been summarized as follows by Thomas F. Pettigrew. Both were closed systems with little chance of manumission, emphasis on survival and single omnipresent authority the profound personality char change created by nazi internment as uh, as independently reported in a number of psychologists and psychiatrists who survived was toward child, child childishness and total acceptance of the ss guards as father figures the white man is still father figure in the black community especially among who especially among black women. A syndrome strikingly similar to the Sambo caricature of the Southern slave. This is game. This is game. This is, this is why they hated this document. The liberals hated this. They hated this document. Even to this day, they hate this document. 19th century races readily believed that the Sambo personality was simply an inborn racial type. Yet no African, African anthropolo anthropological data ever have ever shown that any personality type resembling Sambo and the concentration, concentration camps molded the equivalent personality pattern in a wide variety of Caucasian prisoners. Nor was the sample merely a product of slavery in the abstract. For a less devastating Latin American system, it never, it never, developed, such, never developed such a type. Extending this line of reasoning, psychologists point out that slavery in all its forms sharply lowered the need for achievement in slaves get this this is game boss this is game this is hard core game Psycholog psychologist point out that slavery in all its forms sharply lowered the need for achievement 
in slaves. We still suffer from that today. Negroes in bondage, stripped of their African heritage, were placed in a completely dependent role. All of their reward, all their rewards came not from individual initiative and enterprise, but from absolute obedience. A situation that severely depresses the need for achievement among all people. Get this. This is this is game. I could highlight. I could highlight the whole page. I could highlight the whole page. This is how much game he's given up. Most important of all, slavery. Uh, OK, do this one again. Slavery vitated family life since many slave owners neither fostered Christian marriage among their slave couples nor hesitated to separate them on the auction block. Since many slave owners need, OK, neither fostered Christian marriage among their slave couples nor Ailey hesitated to separate them on the auction block. The slave household often developed fatherless, matrifocal, uh, mother-centered pattern. This is what black feminists hate. This is what black feminists absolutely hate. They hate this. And this was known, this is known 50 years, this is actually known more than 50 years ago. This is written uh, by, this is uh, a, some, a pattern uh, W.E. Du Bois noticed. The Reconstruction. With the emancipation of slaves, the Negro American family began to form in the United States on a widespread scale. This is very true. It's been noted. But it did so in an atmosphere markedly different from which has produced white American family. The Negro was given liberty, but not equality. Life remained remained hazardous and marginal of the of the greatest importance. The Negro male, particularly in the South, became the ob, an object of an intense hostility and attitude and unquestionably based in some measure on fear. This is game. It still is today. Look how many uh, 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 African-American males, black American males still get shot by police, get harassed by police and uh, still suffer with intense hostility. Uh, Philando Castile. We just saw this. When Jim Crow made its appearance, Towards the end of the 19th century, it may be speculated that it was the Negro male who was the most humiliated thereby. This is giving up game. I can't mark. I can, you know, I can't mark up the whole page. The male was more likely to use public facilities, which rapidly became segregated once the process began. And just as important, segregation and the submissiveness it exacts is surely more destructive to the male than it is to the female personality. Bam, bam, bam. I almost feel like just dropping the mic and walking off. Let me highlight that. I got to highlight this. Just as important, segregation and the submissiveness it exacts is surely more destructive to the male than to the female personality. Whew, let's keep going. Keeping the Negro in his place can be translated as keeping the male, the Negro male in his place. The female was not a threat to anyone. I know the swirlers aren't going to like this. Unquestionably, these events worked against the emergence of a strong father figure. The very essence of the male animal from the bantam rooster to the four star general is to strut. Indeed, in the 19th century America, a particular type of exaggerated male boastfulness came from almost a national style. Not for the Negro male. The sassy nigger was lynched. Ooh.
Bam. In this situation, the Negro family made but little progress toward the middle class. The, the pattern of uh, uh, class pattern of the present time. Margaret Mead has pointed out that while in every known human society everywhere in the world, the young males learn that when he grows up, one of these one of these things one of the things which he must do in order to be a full member of society is to provide food for some female and her young this pattern is not immutable however it can be broken though it has always eventually re reasserted itself within the family each new generation of young males learn the to learn the appropriate nurturing behavior and superimpose upon their biological given maleness this learned a parental role when the family breaks down as it does under slavery under certain forms of indentured labor and serfdom in periods of extreme social unrest during wars revolutions famines and epidemics or in periods of ab abrupt transition from the type of, of, of economy to another, which is which is let's let's my let's let's highlight that. Or in periods of abrupt transitions from one type of economy to another, this delicate line of transmission is broken. Can we say the Industrial Revolution? Can we say the modern digital revolution, folks? Come on, come on. Can I get a holler? Men may flounder badly during in, in these periods during which the primary unit may again become mother and child. They are biologically given. And the special conditions under which a man has held his social traditions and trust are violated and distorted. This is game and it's still going on today. E. Franklin Frazier makes clear that the time of at the time of emancipation negro women were already accustomed to playing the oh my god oh my god this is game this is game this is why they this is why black female feminists hate the monahan report and have tried to suppress it for for 50 years this is game E. Franklin Frazier makes it clear that the, at, the uh, at the time of emancipation, Negro women were already accustomed to playing the dominant role in the family and marriage and relations. Guess what? That means what? Matriarchy. And that this role persisted in the, in the decades of rural life that followed. It never got fixed. It was a matriarchy in slavery and it became a matriarchy as it as it evolved into a matriarchy in Jim Crow. It never got fixed. Urbanization, country life and city life are profoundly different. We have come to find that out. The gradual shift of American society from rural to an urban base, urban bases over the past century and a half caused abundant strains, many of which are still much in evidence. When this shift occurs suddenly and drastically in one or two generations, the effect is immensely disruptive of traditional social patterns. It was this abrupt transition that produced the wild Irish slums of the 19th century northeast drunkenness does this sound familiar folks drunkenness crime corruption discrimination family disorganizations juvenile delinquency were the routine of that era in our own time the same sudden transition has produced the negro slum different from but hardly better than its predecessors this is not have anything to do with racial identity this is a natural human reaction different from but hardly better than its predecessors and fundamentally the result of the same process you get that you see this this is game boss this is game folks
This is how come this has to be studied. I mean, studied, not read, but studied. Negroes are now more urbanized than whites. And he goes through a stat of, of uh, white urbanization by percentage and Negro urbanization by percentage. Look at this. Look at this. This is this is your problem. Negro families in the cities are more frequently hit. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Negro families in the cities are more frequently headed by a woman than those in the country. The difference between the white and the Negro proportions of families headed by a woman is greater in the city than in the country. It's because uh, uh, their tradition came from more cities in in in, uh, in uh, Western Europe. Their uh, the urban city was built around the um, the nuclear family unit, which was a tradition in northern european white people it was not a tradition in african well african culture and especially when they in a rural african culture percent of negro families with female head in by region and area in 1960 look at that look at that look at the difference compared to a rural farm more than double more than double the, the urban the urban the urbanization of the Negro is the biggest problem of the family. But let's continue. The promise of the city has so far been denied the majority of the Negro migrants and most particularly the Negro family, because guess who was uh, discriminated against the Negro, uh, the, the male, the Negro male uh, suffered harsh discrimination on the job site. In 1939, E. Franklin Frazier described the plight movingly in, in that part of the Negro family entitled The City of Destruction. The impact of hundreds of thousands of rural southern Negroes upon northern metropolitan communities presents a bewildering, bewildering spectacle. Striking contrast in levels of civilization and economic well-being among these newcomers to modern civilization seem to baffle any attempt to discover order and direction in in their mode of life in many cases of course the discuss the dissolution of simple family organization has begun before the family reaches the northern city but if these families have managed to preserve their integrity until they reach the northern city poverty ignorance and color f uh, force them to seek homes in deteriorated slum areas from which practically all institutional life has disappeared. Woo! Hence, at the same time that these simple rural families are losing their in internal cohesion, listen to this, they are being freed from the controlling force of public opinion and communal institutions. In other words, they, they lose, they're losing their extended family and the social pressure from the extended family once they leave the, the rural area from where they came from. So basically there are no controls and the family starts to break down. Family desertion, desertion among Negroes in cities appears then to be one of the in, inevitable consequences of the, of the impact of urban life on the simple family organization and folk uh, culture, which the Negro has evolved in the rural South. This is exactly what I, I, I just said. The distribution of uh, desertions in relation to the general economic and cultural organization of Negro communities have grown up in our American cities shows a striking manner the influence of selective factors in the process of adjustment to urban environment. And a lot of times it wasn't the black, the black men deserting the family, which um, Du Bois actually showed. It was that that man could not find a job and he was ejected from the family. So to get uh, public assistance, the, the, the wife 
had to go in and actually say that the, the that the uh, husband deserted her. In a lot of states, um, a lot a lot of states, the only way you can get assistance if is uh, is if um, you were is if you that the you could prove that the man deserted you and left you and your um, and his offspring to fend for themselves. Frazier concluded in his classic study, The Negro Family, with the with the prophecy that the travail of civilization ha is not yet ended. First, it appears that the family which evolved within the isolated world of the Negro folk will become increasingly disorganized. Modern means of communication will break down will, will break down the isolation of the world of black folk. And as long as the bankrupt system of Southern agriculture exists, Negro families will continue to seek a living in the towns and cities of the country. They will crowd the slum areas of the of Southern cities or make their way to, to Northern cities where their family life will become disruptive and their poverty will force them to depend on charity. One third of non-white children live in broken homes. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And this is in 1960. This is 1960. And it was one third. What is it now? It's, it's tripled. But um, I, um, I'm going to end it right here because I'm we're running up on, well, we're over 30 minutes now. I'm going to end it right here. I'm going to break this up. So um, check back for the continuation of this uh, piece in part five. But for now, um, I hope this is um, gave you something to chew on, something to think about. I do believe that this discussion should continue. And I hope that you guys take what I've said and my opinions, because this is just my analysis and my opinion and extend this work, extend this work, use this work. Read it for yourself uh, uh, when you talk to, especially when we're talking to, to black women. Point to this because the, the, uh, the feminists totally ignore this study. They have no grounds to stand on. They have no grounds to stand on. When you point to stuff in black and white and uh, uh, point to uh, this uh, very well documented, very well researched, very well um, footnoted document that, that, uh, it was actually brilliant, brilliant work. Um, it can't be refuted. I mean, I'm trying to refute it and I can't refute everything that he has said has resonated with me. It's exactly what we've experienced. In fact, it, like I said, he understated this stuff. The, if he had if he, quickly, if uh, uh, Monaghan could come back and write this uh, right now. Um, and I think he said it was actually worse. I would try to f find that where he said that he understated the problem. I'll try to find that clip and put it in the next one. But, it, but right now, uh, I'm going to end this, and uh, I hope you get something out of it. This is uh, BGA, BGS signing out. Until next time.